All right. Well, um, I want to open with a meditation this morning, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the reason we were looking at Mark, go through the structure of the next section of Mark, and then close with a kind of a just some thoughts about why we did what we did this year. And, um, and then maybe leave some time for discussion at the end. And if we have something to say, great. And if not, we can move on quickly to the holiday festivities that you have already planned. <laughs> so for our opening meditation, I'd like to take a moment and just recall your experiences in old fashioned over the last year. We have been on Zoom for more than a year now. Remember, we started before Pentecost last year, which was really um, before the protests that were in Atlanta. The pandemic had already started. We'd been through the presidential election cycle, and we managed to stay in class together through all of that time. So I just close your eyes for a minute and think about whatever comes to your mind about our experiences together over the last year. A lifesaver. Thank you. <laughs> George, I've gotten a lot out of these classes and I'm really grateful, grateful for that. It's been very nurturing and full of learnings and deepenings. So thank you. It felt like an anchor to me with all the craziness and I've still got a child in school and just knowing we could look forward to being together on Sundays. I can't tell you how much I appreciated it, George. I know it wasn't easy. You've also got a young kid at home and thank you for, for doing these um, classes. They've meant a lot to me. It's been a wonderful thing to look forward to on Sunday, particularly the Gospel of John. Yeah. Um, I really have gotten into the centering pri prayer uh, in a way that, and that's really, when I talk about the deepening, that's been the primary avenue for me. And I really had no idea about it prior to this class. I have enjoyed being with all of you and learned a great deal by being with all of you. It has deepened my understanding of John and Mark and prayer and, and why we are church. So I'm thankful for that. Well, it's just good every week to see everyone's faces when you're isolated. And it has really deepened our sense of community, I think, even though we couldn't see each other in person. Mm. It's true. I, I, it's really fun to do. You know, I know that no matter what topic we are addressing, there are six people in the class who know a whole lot more about it than me, and another 43 who would if, they take, if they'd had the time to study it. So it's truly a privilege to have that kind of group. You know, there's another piece, too, for me, which is um, coming to appreciate uh, the strengths that the virtual medium actually has, uh, brings to the table. There are strengths um, that I've really been able to appreciate and experience in the context of this class, which I hadn't before. I mean, it's not, it, for my money, it's not always the case that in-person is the strongest or the best medium. Mm. And um, so, and that this class has helped to clarify that for me. Yeah, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how we manage that going forward. As I mentioned, we'll be hybrid from this point forward. When we come back in the fall, we'll be in child hall, but the Zoom setups are there and we've tested them and you'll be able to Zoom in from wherever you are. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to Zoom in from my choir rehearsal room. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. 
No, but you can always be able to watch it later. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Laura, that's that's in what I will be doing. But you know, I love being able to participate. You know, that's it, on, in real time. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you for those thoughts. I'm feeling a real sense of gratitude. So I hope you are too. The Lord be with you. And with also you. with you. Let us pray. Days pass and the years vanish and we walk sightless among miracles. Lord, fill our eyes with seeing and our minds with knowing. Let there be moments when your presence, like lightning, illumines the darkness in which we walk. Help us to see wherever we gaze that the bush burns unconsumed, and we, clay touched by God, will reach out for holiness and exclaim and wonder how filled with awe is this place and we did not know it. How filled with awe is this place, and we did not know it. Amen. Well, the portion of Mark that we will address this morning is what Myers calls a direct action campaign. And it starts off with kind of a paradigmatic exorcism followed by a healing, but then it it adopts a very familiar form. If you look at chapter one, beginning in verse 21 and run it through the third chapter, you will see a form that you've seen before. There is an outer frame, the beginning and the end are sounding similar themes. There is an inner frame, the, right after the beginning and right before the end, you see episodes sounding familiar themes all of which have a concentric structure pointing to the middle. And it's in that middle where I think the narrative is the richest. So the outer frame, which begins in really verse 16 through 20, so the end of what we talked about yesterday, has the calling of the disciples and an exorcism and an indirect conflict with the scribes. And then, of course, going home for the healing with Peter's family. That corresponds to the end of this section, which is the disciples are named. So they were called at the beginning. They are named at the end. There's a controversy over exorcism. There is a direct clash with the scribes. It's not indirect any longer. It's very direct. And then he's at home with Jesus's family. So you can see the healing or exorcism, the controversy, and the presence at home. But one also yields to the other. What is indirect becomes very direct, which helps us sense, I think, why Mark is writing this narrative. The inner frame is really about geography. It's the expansion of Jesus's ministry. So he goes at the in the first part of that inner frame throughout Galilee. He is preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. This is verse 39. And then at the end, a great multitude from Galilee follows him. And also we are told Judea and Jerusalem and from beyond the Jordan and from Tyre and Sidon. This is all in the seventh verse of the third chapter. So you can see that the geographic expansion of his ministry has also attracted larger numbers of people. And he is in Mark's narrative off and running, if you will. But that all leads to the center, to the structural center of this section, which is two healing stories, which are fundamentally controversies with the scribes and the priestly classes. Mm -hmm. That's followed by three conflict stories, which are fundamentally fights with the Pharisees. So we've got everybody included here, the scribes and the priestly class and the Pharisees. All of this culminates in a confrontation in the synagogue, which results in the political and religious authorities hatching a plot to kill Jesus. So if you're wondering about the political nature of this narrative, that finish really gives it to us. It's 
after these three chapters, only three chapters of Mark, that the authorities are plotting the death of Jesus. Which leads us, I think, to ask, why? Why had they decided Jesus has to die? And to begin answering that question, I want to go back to that very first story, which begins in the 21st verse of the first chapter. It starts off with, they went to Capernaum. And we learn later in that telling that it was on the Sabbath. So you will remember I talked about the movement from the margin to the center and then back to the margin, that this movement has thematic importance in the Gospel of Mark. So here's Jesus from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And he comes into Capernaum, which is the city, if you will, goes right to the synagogue, the sacred place, at on the Sabbath, the sacred time. It is the symbolic center of the center. Now, here's an interesting fact about Capernaum. Wikipedia believes the population of Capernaum at this time was probably about 1,500, which I think is also the attendance at our children's pageant for Christmas. <laughs> so just to give you a sense of the size of things, I just thought that was fascinating, 1,500 people. But that's the city. That's where he goes. All right. So he walks into the synagogue, and he's immediately confronted by a demon. And so when we have read this story before, I at least have always focused on the confrontation of the demon and the miracle of the exorcism and thinking about what does that mean? What does it mean? Is it a healing of some kind of physical wound? Is it a healing of a mental or psychic illness? How would we translate that happening using our kind of medical and psychological understandings, right? We spend a lot of time there. I think that's not what this is about at all. I think this is more about the symbolic nature of the exorcism and not the fact that Jesus as healer triumphs over the laws of nature. I don't think it's as much about Jesus and promoting Jesus as it is about preparing the people of God for the coming reign of God. And I'm going to try to make that argument as we go through this story. I'm going to start by looking at the second verse of this story. The first is they went to Capernaum. It was the Sabbath. They went in the synagogue and Jesus began teaching. And what did they say? What does it say? They, the crowd now, the people in the synagogue were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as having authority and not as the scribe. Well, what does that mean? He had authority and not as the scribes. Was it just a charisma, a personal presence that was drew people to him and seemed authentic and mirrored something for themselves that was helpful in their own self-understanding? Or was it something else? And of course, what Myers is claiming is that the authority that they sensed was the realism of what Jesus taught, so that Jesus was teaching of wholeness and integration and the future of the community, which included all of its members, those on the margin, the least, the lost, and the last, and those at the center. That expansion of who was included, which we'll see referenced time and time again, Myers claims that's the authority that they recognize. See the difference? Yes, there was charisma there, undoubtedly. Yes, there was authenticity there, undoubtedly. But the people felt something, I think, as if they were included in what Jesus was teaching. And so it's not just about spiritual growth, though I do believe that's part of it. It's also about their social and political and economic circumstances. You didn't have separation of church and state back then. Everybody's living in a community. Everybody is suffering the oppression of the Romans, the excessive taxation and the limitations that they all experienced. And everybody is suffering the authority of the religious priests and scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus is speaking to that, I think. We know that Jesus is speaking that because they get upset with him. He wanders in, there's this demon and Jesus 
heals the demon. But the way it happens is interesting, I think. The demon says, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Which can be interpreted as, what do we have in common? Or why are you meddling here? I like that one the best. Why are you meddling here? Because I think that gives us a clue that the demon, the demonic voice, is not just an individual who is possessed, but symbolically the voice of authority, of power, of the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests. We're in control here. We've got a system we're managing. It's what we ought to be doing. Why have you gone to meddling? I think that's the better interpretation of the demonic confrontation. And then to go even further into this symbolic interpretation, the demon tries to name Jesus, right? He says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God, which is what prophets were called, particularly um, Elijah was called in the Old Testament. So this is like a uh, technical term, if you will. He's not just saying you're holy, he's saying, oh, you're one of these prophets, right? And so if you interpret that symbolically as being the voice of the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests, then you get a whole different take on this confrontation and a whole different take on what exorcism might have meant. Jesus' authority is immediately contrasted with that of the ruling authorities. The voice of the demon seems to be speaking in the plural and attempting to control Jesus as if to put down the subversion that his teaching is encouraging. And then Jesus exercises him as if to say, Jesus fully engages in the confrontation and emerges victorious. That, I think, is a very different way to think about this story than to think about it in the frame of a doctor or a psychiatrist curing a malady of an individual, right? So what Myers is going to do throughout the interpretation of Mark is recast the scenes of healing in particular as scenes not of medical miracles, but scenes of social and political and economic symbolism here. And it's not just, as I think anyway, it's not just a matter of saying power is bad and those who used it have been corrupted. It is instead a way of revealing, remember we talked about eschatology as being revelation. It's a way of revealing the principles upon which the reign of God would be present, the principles upon which community should be organized, right? It's not just about taking those who are not in charge and putting them in charge and not changing the rules of the game. It's about changing the rules of the game, which requires creativity and imagination. Now, Luke Timothy Johnson makes this point in his book on miracles that I know some of you have read. It's a wonderful book in which what he claims is part of his major thesis there is that the value of scripture is the imaginative world that it creates. And our task as readers is to be transformed, not by trying to recreate that world, not by trying to go back nostalgically into that world, but by being able to imagine the current world we face with the principles of the scripture. Scripture gives us a way of imagining, and then we apply that imaginative skill to the world that we face and find the presence of God in it, align ourselves with that presence, and attempt to transform not only ourselves, but our communities. And that's what it means to walk as a disciple of Christ, right? Luke takes what, Bonnie, about a thousand pages to make this point, but it's an excellent book. <laughs> And I recommend it to you. And if we have time, we might even take it up ourselves. Myers is making the same point that the world of scripture is a symbolic world. And what it does is stimulate an imaginative understanding of the presence of God, the power of God, Jesus himself. And out of that intuitive understanding, we can change ourselves and change the world. 
by seeing things we couldn't see before, right? This is why I think it's important to say it's not just about change in who's in control, as if that's going to fix anything. History is pretty clear about that. Doesn't fix anything at all except who's in control. You have to change the way the game is played. And that's hard to do because there are reasons we're doing things the way we're doing them, right? So that what Meyerson says is this is a battle of myth. Not myth as in a story that isn't really true, but myth as in a story that really is true in a way that's more important than historical occurrence, in a way that's more important than just facts that could be videoed if there was a videographer following Jesus around, right? And so as Christians, being disciples of Christ means gaining those imaginative faculties so that we learn to see the world in a way different than you might otherwise. And we tend to call that expansion of consciousness, right? Which is what centering prayer, Harris, is all about, right? Centering prayer is all about attempting to let go of your thoughts so that the presence of God that is accessible to you, located within you, gives you a new sense of who you are. You identify with the inner observer and not with your thoughts, not with your anxieties, not with your fears, not with your programs for happiness. And as in that sense, you live a fuller life and can become more compassionate and more empathetic with others, right? That's the promise of our practices, our spiritual practices. And that's what we're trying to do as a community, as a church. So I think Myers is getting to something that's, at least for me, very, very helpful in expanding the scope of things that Mark is talking to. And if you can sense that, then you can gain more out of the Gospels than you could otherwise. It's not a description of a historical occurrence that proves Jesus is stronger than the laws of nature. It is instead an imaginative description of the reign of God that helps us prepare to live in that reign and advance that reign. That's what Jesus's ministry was all about. And so I don't think we fully benefited from scripture if we just walk away as admirers of Jesus, right? If we just walk away thinking, well, he was really a great guy, you know, or in this amazing what he did, or now I believe God is real. I refer to that as being an admirer of Jesus. We are instead on the path to becoming Christ ourselves to becoming one with God, which is an expansion of consciousness that yields a transformation over time, of course, but yields a transformation. And I believe, as I said in my sermon on Pentecost, that that's what we're doing as a church. When we gather together, when we share our lives together, when we pray together and worship together and have fun together and serve the community together, we are raising our consciousness, we are entering into that process of transformation that hopefully allows us to see things we couldn't see before, right? Okay, that I think is what Myers is doing. And if you go through that story, I want you to ask, who is the demon? And why do these confrontations with the ruling class about authority bracket the actual exorcism? And does it matter that it happened on the Sabbath? You know, Jesus immediately goes into Simon Peter's home and heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law. See, all are included in the community of Christ. And, but, he did, but he doesn't go out into the crowd because it's the Sabbath. But what, the next time he goes out is we are told very explicitly, and I don't think it's a throwaway detail, after the Sabbath had ended, then he goes out into the crowd as if to say, Jesus is attempting to observe the laws of the Sabbath to the extent he can. Now, it won't be long, only a chapter or two away, before Jesus is healing on the Sabbath. And then the scribes and priests and Pharisees are setting him up for that controversy on the Sabbath. And that will become a major portion of this narrative. But at the front, it looks like Jesus is not just wandering into conflict that he doesn't need to wander into. He's a little bit more focused than all of that. All right. Any questions about that before I 
go on to the next part of the narrative. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm really intrigued with, you know, this is sort of gets the gets to the academic bent of me, right? I, I'm, I'm clear, I'm, I'd love to hear you talk a little more about the principles that you are articulating. One principle I hear is it is it, it's it's more inclusive. That that we're talking about, um, you know, everyone being, you know, part of um, in the field of interest. You know, everybody. But more, what? How, when, when, I guess we're talking about principles in the in the presence of of, of what Christ is seeking to establish. I, I'm mumbling my words here. What other principles are we talking about here? That's an excellent question, Harris. And even, you know, I've kind of betrayed the, our, our, um, our approach by even calling them principles. As I listened to you ask the question, I, my immediate reaction was, I wish I hadn't used the word principles. <laughs> because I think the truth is that it's more about kind of an imaginative way of seeing the world. Charles Taylor, a Canadian philosopher, refers to this as a moral imaginary. It's kind of all the things we take for granted about how the world works and how we are to be in the world. Taylor argues that our moral imaginary in modern times and after the enlightenment has become one most closely identified with economics. So we take the principles of modern economic theory and that becomes the way we tend to interpret the world. I'll maybe go into this in greater detail later. It's a fascinating thing because it's not that I can list out 10 things, I can and do, but even that, let's, so let's say one principle I would argue is that while um, human rights and dignity of people is important, that, no, I'm sorry, equality and human rights is important, that scriptural imagination yields a principle that goes beyond that. So it's not just about equality, it's also about equity. And it's not just about rights, it's also about justice. And equity and justice import a sense of responsibility and not just a sense of authority. So it's not just about what I can do, it's also about what I owe to others. Right? But that's a principle that I've derived and applied these kind of modern terms to. The moral imaginary is the sense of things that's created by scripture, which is why it's a story and not a list of rules, I think. Bonnie, you look like you're just about to say something. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking about Walter Brueggemann, whose foundational thinking is the prophetic imagination. And I think this is what you're talking about, that the prophet is the one who imagines how community can arrive at synchronicity with the kingdom of God, if you want to say that. That the, the basic human gift is being able to imagine a different scenario. And that's what scripture often does. And that's what this story that you're talking about does. Jesus is imagining an inclusive community that the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests don't imagine. And that's what happens again and again in scripture is someone comes along who has that imagination that things can be different and speaks to the community and calls them to a new way of thinking. And what we need in our community right now is prophets who will imagine a different way than where we are politically speaking. And this is fabulous. Right. So Bonnie, Walter Brueggemann, who taught at Columbia and is a renowned Old Testament scholar, the prophetic imagination is his book and it's a lot thinner than Luke's book on miracles. Yes, it is. It's, <laughs> so, it's one thing for us to be recommending these tomes to you and they're wonderful, but here's a really short 
book. And um, gosh, there's another point he makes in that book, Bonnie, which I wish I could prompt you to remember for me something about the prophetic. But, it, but at any rate, he, he does get back to the point we made two sessions ago that when the prophets are talking about the future, their value is not just predicting the future. It's really a revelation of what the future is going to look like if we don't expand our imaginative understanding of where we are and why we're doing what we're doing. Right? Well, one way of understanding the Holy Spirit is as a revealing spirit that opens the way for us to have this imagination of what the kingdom of God is really like. And Pentecost is a good example of how it's the inclusiveness is revealed in the fact that everyone understands, even if it's in a different language, they understand. And I love that image hmm. yeah thank you but but the scripture is about if you don't have imagination it's very hard to come to scripture and really understand what it's about because it's not about a lot of principles it's about story and story is about imagination and, and I think, Bonnie, I hope I'm not interrupting you, but it, that links directly back to my claims about church, right? Yeah. Your, yeah. your imaginative experience is expanded when you've got different people exactly. who come to the table with different gifts, all of which make up the body of Christ. And there is, if, you know, if somebody's left out, then we're missing something. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate claim. If somebody's left out, we're missing something because they have a gift that nobody else has. And if we don't have the benefit of that gift, we're not fully complete as a body. That's my, I don't know that Paul ever said that, but if he didn't, he should have. And it's probably in First Corinthians somewhere in an early text that was left out. But that is kind of my fundamental belief. When we are talking about the dignity of every human being in our baptismal covenant, you know, that's the last kind of, proposition that we say there and that's what to me that's that's what that means is it there is a community that is not complete if anybody is not there because everybody has a unique gift right but if we start analyzing things that way then it gets hard right so i'm not claiming we just move over here and everything's good like this is all hard and we're not going to get it right till we die and probably not then so it's a journey right and the process is it but we are constantly called to be new and different people. And our faith, particularly as fleshed out in our relationship with each other and in a Christ-centered community, is constantly calling us to do that. And I think you can usually sense the stirrings of the Holy Spirit through your discomfort. <laughs> a good indication that it's the Holy Spirit and not your own projection of self is that it's uncomfortable in some way, right? Okay. All right. Any, th thank you, Harris, for that question. And Bonnie, your uh, patience with me as I worked through principles that got to imagination. But I do think that's the <laughs> way. What, what else comes to mind here? Okay. You can see the difference, though, right, between the healer, the miracle worker, Jesus, who would just be another member of a class that existed in antiquity and were not kicked out of the synagogues, were not treated with disdain. They were tolerated. They're wandering around. I think Jesus is something else. And the, the power structure's reaction to Jesus gives us a good sense of what that something else was. Right. And I think that gives us a new perspective on the exorcisms and the healings, which run throughout the Gospel of Mark, which is the key to understanding what Mark was really trying to get us to do. And as Bonnie has said, really becomes the purpose of Scripture writ large, right? Growing into a new way of imagining the world and our role in it. 
All right. Uh, let me, I'm going to then, rather than go on to the, you know, this gets repeated in Mark, I've given you the overall structure. You'll see that structure repeated in the later part of Mark. I hope that's enticing enough for you to read it over the summer and we'll pick it up. Again, I want to finish Mark before Advent, so we're still in year B, and then we'll do something else as Christmas approaches. But I want to try to situate this in what, in my perception, what's going on with right now, where one way to read what's happening to all of us, like right now in Atlanta, Georgia, in this year with these circumstances, is that we are being forced to reimagine how our community works to reimagine how our government works, to reimagine our role in the world. Maybe we would have elected to do this and maybe not, but it seems to me like we're right there. And you can see it in everything from thoughts about what the government ought to be doing in terms of its interjection into the economy to thoughts about who ought to be making decisions. Is it a federal level decision or a state level decision or a local level of decision. And I'm not offering any solutions to any of those problems, but I think those very questions suggest that we're having to reimagine how we work, what our community looks like. And it seems pretty clear that we don't all agree on what it ought to look like. And I would not be surprised to find that none of the answers that are currently offered are the answer we will ultimately wind up, up with. I hope not. But I do think this idea of being able to be centered enough, Harris, to go back to centering prayer so that we can fully imagine the possibilities is going to be key to our reforming the community in some way that honors all of the community, right? That doesn't leave anybody out. And it's not as simple as implementing another economic system or coming up with another political theory. I think it requires us to be different kind of people, which is why I'm claiming that, or just begging that we not forget that we're Christians as we begin to answer these questions and that we utilize the imaginative structures of scripture and faith when we're trying to answer questions of sociology and politics and economics. It's, I don't think our faith is something we hold over to the side while we answer all these other questions. Nor do I think our faith answers all those questions for us, right? But that imagination is what I think will yield the best answers. And, and I, I, so I'm really hoping that we can take what we have learned through scripture and with each other and in our prayer and have that make us better citizens, right? And, and as a result, our community will change as we transform the community will transform, whether it wants to or not. You know, it's kind of like a family in a way, right? All families have ways that we process our anxiety. And if you want to change a family, don't try to persuade somebody else to do it the way you want to do it. That's not going to work. Just change. If you change, the family changes. And they're not going to like it necessarily. I never have when I've been forced to change, but it has to change. And so accordingly, I think our discipleship of transformation has real impact on the world because as we change, the world is forced to change. Okay. Can I make a comment? Sure. You know, um, so much of the challenge in front of us right now is about being able to listen, to really listen. And the... The centering prayer just really offers a wonderful tool for cultivating that capacity. Um, it, you know, it enables one to, if one is centered, one is better able to listen to other people. That's the best way to describe it. And that's what we need to be doing so much of right now. The capacity to imagine in the way that we're describing right now is rooted in large part with our capacity to listen. Yeah, that's well said. And of course, what I, and I'm saying, even to Jesus, 
right? So listening to Jesus means we have to be able to hear things that we may not want to hear right. or hear things that we hadn't heard before. Because, you know, I don't know about you, but my tendency is to read Jesus in a way that affirms whatever I want to yep. believe, right? And I've been very successful in utilizing scripture for that purpose for a lot of years. So part of listening is literally being able to hear Jesus. And I think that's his mission is to open our ears, those who have ears to hear, right? So that we hear things that we couldn't have imagined before, if you will, right? That's the beauty of God. That God is something we cannot imagine on our own. And so revelation is div divine when it opens up that vista for us and we see things we could not see before. And I, I do wanna make a claim for religion in general, because I do think that most of the major religions have this sense to them that the way there is a transcendent that we all kind of intuit. We all desire to connect with and align ourselves with and live out of that transcendent presence. And the key to doing that is to get out of the way, is to not center on ourselves, to somehow transcend our ego. And then of course you get all kinds of schemes for doing that. Centering prayer is one and Buddhism has a recognizable set, I think, of detachment that you can associate with centering prayer. You can find it in Sufism. You can find it in the Vedanta of Hindu. You can find it in the other Asian religions. They're all focused in many ways on how do we not center on ourselves? How do we transcend our egos in order to hear and react to the divine presence which is there? And so I'm saying there are kind of three things there that the scriptures of all the major religions and certainly the Hebrew and Christian scriptures that we study, we have to divest ourselves of our egoism. The Greek word for this is kenosis, right? Emptying of the self or letting go. Secondly, the best way to do this transcendence is to cultivate habits of empathy and compassion. Right? You can't be empathetic or compassionate if you're not reaching outside of yourself. Right? You can't be totally self-interested and feel those virtues. And I don't think you can have a meaningful community without them. Right? And in Bonnie and Brueggemann's prophetic imagination, doesn't he describe compassion as like the, the moving of your inward being or something or do you remember how he describes that? It's been a long time since I read it. <laughs> it's a visceral thing. It's not like, oh, I, I'm really trying to do something for you. It's like, I'm just, my innards are moved. It's a very visceral. Yeah, well, that's, that's Hebrew scripture is filled with that kind of visceral need to, to turn to God. Yeah. And, again and again the prophets come and say you're unless you turn to god you're going to be in trouble right. right so one we have to divest ourselves of our egoism two the best way to do that is cultivate habits of empathy and compassion three you can't confine your benevolence to your own people You've got to include the stranger and you've got to include the enemy. Yeah. And I think most of the major scriptures articulate a program that includes these three things. And I think Jesus did too. And I think Mark gets to them in a unique way, frankly. John gets to them in a unique way too, which is why it's fun to have both of those things going on. But I do want you to remember those three things. Divesting of egoism, developing habits of empathy and compassion, including the stranger and the enemy. And if that's all we remembered out of this year, I would think we had made some progress because I think those three things are being tested every day. And the deeper the crisis gets, the more we feel threatened, the greater the test, right? And yet the more we can find those three things, the more intimacy, the more vulnerability, the greater our relationships. So my father used to say, I'd rather be right 
than be in, I'd rather be in relationship than be right. <laughs> and it took me 50 years to get a glimpse of what he was talking about. But I think it's a good guide. I'd rather be in relationship than be right. I would add my own kind of addition to that would be, I can't be right if I'm not in relationship. Because most relationships worth their metal are constantly testing what you thought was right as they help us do those three things, right? They're all required of that relationship to divest ourselves of our egoism, to develop habits of empathy and compassion and to extend our benevolence to strangers and enemies, right? Our ability to do that does create our ability to be in relationship and being in relationship does require that of us, I think. So that's what I wanna leave you with. I'd rather be in relationship than be right. And to do that, I have to have an imaginative presence. I have to learn how to hear what Christ is saying, whether it's through the scripture or Harris through other people, right? Christ speaks using a variety of different voices. And we have to learn to hear those and then develop an imaginative response that imagines a world that we didn't think about before that by virtue of being imagined begins to come into existence, right? That's the miracle, I think, that the mere imagining of a different world begins the process of allowing it to come into existence. And that, I think, is good news. So that's what I've been trying to say all year. I just didn't know it until now. <laughs> so thanks for listening. And before we close, which I want to do with our prayer for community that we've been using, I'm wondering if there are any comments or questions about that or additions that you'd like to add? I, 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 I do have a question. Um, is, is your, uh, is it, has it been the pattern in past to take time off during the summer from these? Is that what you've done in the past, George? No, in the past, what we've done is I've organized a summer series where yeah. I, um, where a number of other people carry most of the teaching responsibility. So typically it was something where some kind of thing where somebody could do something as a standalone feature each week. And, um, and this summer, I just sensed profound exhaustion. Got it. And, um, and didn't, I didn't have the energy to do it myself, and I didn't have the heart to ask anybody else to do it. And so that, it's a unique summer in that regard. So well, but I'm, I'm hoping really... that our fall is not just a return, but a revival. So let, every, let all of us take sabbatical over the summer and come back hungry in the fall. I'm really grateful that I um, read your little OFS uh, email uh, because had I not done that, I wouldn't have realized that this was going to be the last prior to the summer. And I'm really glad that I was able to be here. So yeah. thank you. Well, me too. Me too. All right. George, thank Gene Morris hey. coming in late. Thank you for letting me in after I got back from church in person. And today's I got I think I got more today than I have the whole time. Well, and thanks, thanks to the other comments that came in. And I, I guess I've been feeling kind of guilty about using my imagination, but I won't anymore. Excellent. Okay. I love, the, I love the imaginative way that you put the dove on your photo. I have no idea how I did that. <laughs> and I don't no, know how to get a, it off. It's a good sign for the rest of us. <laughs> we brought the spirit in, whether we wanted it or not. And I, I don't know how to even change the picture. The picture is now about five years old. They seem to improve if you leave them up there long enough. And <laughs> But anyway, thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank Bonnie and, and uh all of the rest of the comments today they were wonderful thank you so much okay well i will miss you guys over the summer and i will look forward to seeing you in the fall and i will publish between now and then exactly what we're going to do um, yeah. as always i welcome emails and texts and calls if you have thoughts um, i learn every time you offer them 
All right. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Loving God, you fill all things with a fullness and hope that we could never comprehend. Thank you for leading us into a time where more of reality is being unveiled for us all to see. We pray that you will take away our natural temptation for cynicism, denial, fear, and despair. Help us have the courage to awaken to greater truth, greater humility, and greater care for one another. May we place our hope in what matters and what lasts, trusting in your eternal presence and love. Listen to our heart's longings for the healing of our suffering world. Knowing, good God, that you are hearing us better than we are speaking, we offer these prayers and all the holy names of God. Amen. 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 May you know that you are blessed and be a blessing to others. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank be to God. Thanks be to God. Bye, George. Have a wonderful great summer. summer. George, have a great summer, man. Bye. Rest and recoup. <laughs>